Hello, welcome everyone. Um, feel free to say hi. Be great to hear from you in the chat. Uh, welcome. I hope you're having a good weekend so far. So we've got a nice session today planned on graph transformations. Um, so we'll, we'll start that shortly. Do feel free to say hi in the chat. It'd be great to hear from you. Um, and I hope you're all doing well. I know September's now out of the way, so we're well into this new term. Um, but yeah, do feel free to say hello. I've got the chat open here. Be great to hear from people and I hope it's all going well. Keep me updated with how you're doing in school, what you've been covering recently. This is very much a pure maths topic um, and should extend what we've learned at GCSE very much into the kind of A-level content. So that's what we're going to look at today. Be great to hear from you, as I said, throughout the session. So if you've got questions, if you want to share answers, do let us know. Um, and yeah, as I said, the chat's open, so I'll try and keep an eye on that as we run through the content today. So I'm just about to share my screen so we can get started. But welcome. I hope it's all going well. Let me know if this is a topic you've covered recently or if it's new. So this is graph transformations that we're looking at today. And it'll be great to hear from you. Lovely to see people join in the session. So here we go. I'm about to share the screen and let's get started. So hopefully you'll be able to see this full screen in a second if it's not already shown there we go cool excellent right welcome guys if you've just joined we are just getting started now so thanks for joining so promptly i hope you're all having a good weekend and september has gone well and um, it's now out the way and we're going to start by looking at this pure maths topic of graph transform so Graph transformations is something you've hopefully seen at GCSE. You may have even touched on it already at A-level. It's going to be kind of a recurring idea that keeps coming up throughout the pure content. So it'd be great to hear from you in the chat. Do feel free to say hello, ask any questions, answer as we go along, and also um, feel free to update me with what you're currently covering as well. So I'm Max. I'm the lead maths teacher at Snap Revise. I did a maths degree a few years ago now. And I've been teaching A-level maths for about the last six years and GCSE and Key Stage 3 as well. Uh, but it's been an interesting time for teaching the A-level um, as the syllabus changed and also the last couple of years have been quite interesting anyway. So, um, yeah, it's, it's good to kind of get on with this content and be great to hear from you throughout the day. So uh, please do feel free to say hi in the chat and ask any questions. I should be able to see those coming through. So let's get started. Thank you all for joining. Uh, what we're going to look at is really take this topic into the A-level pure content. So we're going to not only recap graph transformations, but also look at the shape of reciprocal and exponential graphs and then apply graph transformations to those harder graphs that we deal with at A-level. And um, this is a really important topic that we can't sort of shy away from. We have to be confident with throughout year 12 and 13 content. We're also going to understand what asymptotes are, and how their transformation affects the asymptotes and kind of key features of the graph as well. We won't be doing just all sorts of polynomial graphs or modulus functions, but this idea does carry on into that content in year 13, as I'm sure some of you have covered or started to cover already. So as I said, it'd be great to hear from you. I'm hoping that the chat is working. I think it is. So if you've got any questions or comments throughout, feel free to share those. Right, let's get started. Uh, thank you again for joining so promptly to those that are here. What we're going to just look at, just as a quick reminder, the kind of prerequisite GCSE knowledge is that if we're dealing with a graph transformation, so let's take maybe a parabola like x squared, you might flip it round, you might translate it, reflect it. Um, and that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with how the equation changes and how that will look on a graph. And if we can shortcut things and understand transformations a bit better it might help us sketch which is a big part of the a-level pure content it's a, a really key skill so for example translations could be something like this or something like this now let me know if you recognize this just a yes or a no if this is something you remember um, and the thing i always do to jog people's memories with this stuff is inside the brackets kind of you do the opposite to x and then outside the brackets, you do what it says to the y values. So f of x plus a would be uh, f of x plus a in the brackets would move it minus a like to the left. So let me know if this is familiar. 
f of x plus b, this would be a y transformation, and you translate it up or down depending on if b was positive or negative. Um, the other types of transformation we have are f of ax. Again, inside the brackets, you do the opposite to x. So that would sort of squash it or compress it. And then outside the brackets, you'd be scaling it vertically. And then the other types of transforms we have are reflections. So f of minus x and minus f of x. And these are both reflections. So let me know if you recognize that, because we're going to crack straight on now with the A-level kind of content. Um, but that is sort of knowledge that should be there from GCSE. So um, if you need any of that re-explained or anything, let me know. Um, but this, as we can see, whether you're doing AQA, OCR or Edexcel exams, this is a really crucial skill that will build and build throughout year 12 and 13. And we'll need to apply these graph transforms to harder, more involved graphs as we go. So let's um, get straight on with this now and look at reciprocal graph transformations. And as I said, do feel free to keep me updated in the chat. Let me know if you've seen this before. It'd be great to hear from you guys. So the simplest reciprocal function that we could deal with is something like one over X. And just feel free to give me a yes or a no in the chat if you've seen that graph before and you're quite happy sketching one over X. And when I say sketch, I mean, the general sort of shape and the asymptotes and how it looks. Um, obviously, you could plot it with a table of values, but just a general sketch. Let me know if you're kind of happy with that. So that would be great to know. Right. So one over X is actually sketched there for us to, to recognize. And what we have is actually the axes are the asymptotes. So the X and Y axis are the lines that the graph infinitely approaches but never touches. So they are what we call asymptotes. So in the graph of this function, X and Y axes are asymptotes. That's what we'll be calling them. Um, and what these are, if you might have seen these before for different types of functions and graphs as well. So the graph gets closer and closer, as we mentioned, and we can kind of see that anyway. but never touches. Okay, so we need to be happy with that general shape because now what we're gonna do is transform this graph and we're gonna shift it, reflect it and do all those sorts of things and be able to sketch that from the equation. So if I move this on, do feel free to ask me to go back or double check anything. Let's move on from the basic one over X graph now and have a little look at the following. So we have the one over X graph drawn out twice as a comparison. Can anyone tell me what one over X plus one would be as a graph transformation? How would it look? What will we do to that original graph? So I've got one over X drawn. I know what that looks like. That's all sketched out. And now I want to draw the graph of one over X plus one. So what kind of transformation is this? What can I do to the one over X graph to deal with and, and produce the one over X plus one graph? Hi, welcome. If you've just said hi in the chat, um, thank you for joining as well. And do feel free to comment and ask questions. I'm just seeing if anyone knows how to transform this one over X graph so that we actually have this graph here. I think maybe some of the messages aren't actually coming through. I've only seen a couple of messages so I can just see hi um, and a couple of others. Well done, excellent. I'm starting to see some messages now. So brilliant suggestion. We are going to move this graph to the left by one. Um, thank you for that suggestion. That's brilliant. So sorry if there's messages I've missed, um, but I think they're coming through now. So this is effectively f of x plus one because it's the one over x graph, but we've done x plus one in the function. So well done if you recognize that this is a shift of this graph to the left by one. So what we can do is we can actually point by point move them to the left by one. That's kind of how I would go about this. So I would move point by point one unit to the left. Um, and we'll notice what that does to the asymptotes as well. So brilliant if you've spotted that's what we need to do. I'm going to move all the points one unit to the left. 
okay? And what that would actually do as a result is it will also move the asymptote, the vertical asymptote, one unit to the left as well, because the whole graph has moved. So it's not moving up or down, it's not stretching. What it's doing is it's just a shift to the left by one. So the whole graph moves and that in turn affects that vertical asymptote. So I've just pushed the whole graph to the left by one. Brilliant if you've recognized that. So what you've done is you've made the connection with this and this following graph transformation. So we had the graph of one over X. Oh, sorry, let me put that back, um, which is here. Just try and highlight it nice and neatly. So this is one over X. So if I want to compare one over X plus one to that, it's a shift to the left by one. So everything, including the asymptote, will just move to the left. And I've been able to shift it in the following way. So what do we think this will do? What kind of graph transformation have we got going on here? Oh, sorry about that. So this one here, one over X plus one, how does that differ? How is that, what's going on with this type of transformation? So again, we're comparing it back to the one over X graph, which is already pre-drawn for us that we should we could kind of know looks like this, has the asymptotes at the axes. Excellent suggestion again, thanks very much for that, that's superb. So this time, you're absolutely right, this is the graph of f of x, like plus one on the outside. So this is a graph transformation in the y direction, excellent. So in the y sort of sense vertically, the graph is gonna move up by one. That is absolutely brilliant, well done. So again, we can apply the same sort of idea of going sort of point by point, move the individual points up by one. And this time notice what this is gonna to do to the asymptote. Well done, excellent suggestions guys. And thank you for sending those in in the chat as well. So all the individual points, the Y values are gonna move up. Um, and consequently, what we're gonna see is that again, this time another asymptote is going to change, but this will be the horizontal asymptote that will in turn move up by one as well. So the asymptote, instead of being at the x-axis, will now be up at the line y equals one. And the graph will shift up accordingly. So instead of tending towards the x-axis, it's now tending towards the line y equals one is up there okay and infinitely approach and never touch and do try and sketch that as neatly as possible but very well done hopefully we're kind of happy with that that's really good um super excellent so that was a nice kind of use of graph transformation where they've not explicitly said this is f of x this is f of x plus one you've had to understand the notation understand that actually that is the relationship that's being defined so very well done, if that makes sense. Um, now, this one, this is interesting because trying to kind of know the subtle differences here is really important. Um, any suggestions on what kind of transformation this first one is? So again, we're still transforming the very basic one over X reciprocal graph, but how exactly are we transforming it this time? So let's think about the function notation, the F of X stuff. What kind of graph transformation is this? I personally think this one is maybe a little bit harder to spot. Um, so do let me know if you think, actually, yes, I know how this should look. I know what kind of graph transformation this is describing. Please do let me know in the chat. Um, and don't worry if you're not sure or if it's wrong, um, because this is, this is important to go through. And these could be exam sort of questions, knowing that you can sketch this and you can sketch this on the same axes. So one over two X, what kind of graph transformation is that to the graph one over X? How have we transformed one over X to get this one over two X graph? Right, excellent suggestion. So it's in the, it's definitely gonna affect the X direction if we treat it as within the function. So if we think of it as F of two X, now the only thing that I personally think is harder about these ones is inside the brackets, you kind of do the opposite to X. So it is a stretch or a compression on the x-axis or the x-direction horizontally, but actually because it's 2x, which would normally imply like you're doubling it, because it's in the function, we actually um, half it. 
So it sort of compresses it by a factor of two. So it sort of stretches it horizontally, but by the factor of a half. Does that kind of make sense? A bit like when you shift it, you do the opposite way around in the brackets. The same with if you times it, you compress it. So it's always the, the X ones that are a little bit trickier. So for example, here, what we could do with the individual points is divide them by two. So this would go to here and you're compressing all the graph in slightly. And so the individual points are kind of sort of be going halfway through. Now, interestingly, it won't ultimately change the asymptotes. It will just compress the individual points. So you've compressed it in the x direction by a factor of two, or by, by a factor of a half. Does that make sense? So well done if you did in, interpret this as something that's going to affect x because it's one over two x. So effectively, the bit that's being affected is within the function, within the reciprocal idea. So very well done with that. Excellent comments in the chat. Um, but do just sort of confirm that you're happy with that and let me know if that needs re-explained. Um, this one, however, would be on like on the outside, two f of x. Because remember, when we do two times one over x, that becomes two over x. Like two times a fifth would be two fifths. You're kind of really only affecting the numerator. So this one is going to stretch it in the y direction by a factor of two. So this one's going to stretch it this way by two. So hopefully that's nice and clear. Um, and I'll do that now. So this point here that is at minus one is now going to be at minus two. This point at minus two will be down at minus four. Right down there, this point here. So it's sort of doubling, it's sort of spreading it, stretching it out in the y direction vertically. Hello, welcome if you're just joining. Um, do feel free to ask any questions if you want to check anything. Um, that would be great. So we've just been doing some graph transformations of the reciprocal graphs. Um, and we've kind of compared them all to one over X. So we've done a few there. Now there's another type of graph that I think is really, the type of graph transformation I think is really important. And it's these ones here, the reflections. So can anyone suggest what this would do if we interpret it as inside the function? So one over minus X, um, we think of it inside the function. Does anyone know what type of reflection that would be? So inside the brackets, you're kind of affecting the X values. So you're actually reflecting it around the Y axis. And what that would produce if we do that, and you might recognize this graph anyway, you might be quite happy with this, the negative reciprocal graph should be a, a reflection of the original one around the y-axis. Like that. Is that OK? Does that make sense? So that's a reflection in the y-axis. Now, interestingly, if we interpret this one as the minus on the outside, this would be a reflection in the x-axis. And it's really interesting because for this graph, that is actually ultimately the same thing. Because you might have actually been looking at the equation thinking, how is that different to that? And it actually isn't for this graph. One over minus x or minus one over x or minus one in the top over x, they're all the same thing. Um, but we could interpret it as a, a reflection in a different way. And for this type of graph, it would produce the same end result. So whether it was a reflection in the X or Y axis for a reciprocal graph, that produces the same end result. So hopefully that's nice and clear. Now, there's one other graph that does sort of crop up in year 12. Um, and then obviously you would be expected to still know it for the A-level exams at the end of year 13. Um, and that's actually this graph here. So the graph of a reciprocal square function. And for a lot of the courses, this is just sort of filtered into the exercises in the textbooks. And maybe the attention isn't really drawn to it particularly. 
Uh, but this is a function of the type one over x squared. And we'll think about why it looks like this. Um, but in this graph, the x and y axes are still asymptotes. So they're still sort of the lines that it infinitely approaches but never touches. However, this kind of graph will always be above the x-axis, unless we do something weird to it and reflect it. 1 over x squared is above the x-axis. And the reason is, because if we're squaring any of these values, we're effectively turning them positive and making them bigger. So it will look like that. Let me know in the chat if you've seen this type of graph before, just a yes or a no, if you recognize 1 over x squared. Because if you, if you do recognize 1 over x squared, then actually you recognize the whole family of functions or family of curves that are the same. 2 over x squared would look very similar as a sketch. 3 over x squared. So it'd be good to hear from you if you've seen this kind of graph before. It might have popped up or appeared in an exercise you've done in the textbook. You might have seen it in a past paper question. But it is really good to know and recognize this shape. Yeah, excellent, good. I'm seeing the messages coming through in the chat. Absolutely. So it might not be one you learn explicitly at GCSE, but it definitely appears in year 12 content and beyond. So to know that it's positive, it still has asymptotes, but the graph sort of reflects up and it's all the same way is really handy to recognize. Um, excellent. So just a little checkpoint, and then we're going to carry on with a few other types of graphs. So if you want to give me a one, two, or a three, with how you're feeling with that, just to give me an idea. We'll follow this up with an exam question, and then we'll look at graph transformations of exponentials. So in the chat, if you want to put a one, two, or a three, just to indicate how you feel with that content, it might be that you're actually really confident with that, you've done a lot of this stuff before, or it is just one of those things that you think, no, I get it, I, I do understand that. Or it might be something that you know, maybe you need a little bit of work on. So let me know in the chat. It'd be great to hear from you. Thank you if you've already suggested it's all good or however you're feeling with it. Do put that in the chat now. So just a one, two or a three would be great. And then what we'll do is I'm going to share a couple of quick exam questions just to sort of consolidate this and then we'll move on. Brilliant. So here are three quick questions. So it's the first one says sketch the graph or sketch, sketch the curve y equals minus one over x squared. So first of all, let's think of what we know about 1 over x squared. We've just learned it looks like that. And at A level, it is important to remember that a lot of the time you're asked to sketch. You're not asked to particularly plot. You're asked to sort of sketch them to show you understand the general shape. You get what's going on. You know what the key features are. So minus 1 over x squared is effectively minus f of x squared. Look, if this is f of x, this is a reflection of it in the x-axis. So this graph will look like that. Brilliant. Now the second one, just gonna get this all set up and ready to go. Have a little think of how that would transform the one we just did. So what kind of graph transformation of part one is part two? What's happening to this graph here in this scenario? Any suggestions? Because we can sort of build on what we've just done. So I've just sketched the graph minus one over x squared. Now I want to sketch the graph three minus one over x squared. Or you could think of it as minus one over x squared plus three. If you want to tag that addition of three onto the end, it might be a little bit more obvious to then think of it oh, there's a plus three on the outside of the function I'm dealing with. So what does that do to the graph? What does this plus three do to the function if it's sort of outside of the function? It's going to affect it in what sort of way? Well, it will, it will affect it vertically, so it will be a shift upwards by three. So what that will mean, and well done if you've got that, do feel free to share answers still it will push the asymptote up to the line y equals three. Brilliant, so hopefully that's nice and clear. Now this one here, um, oh actually I don't need a graph for that one. This one here says 
The curve minus one over X squared is stretched parallel to the Y axis with a scale factor of two. State the equation of the transformed graph. So if I think of this as like G of X, then I'm doing two G of X, I'm times it by two. So, so hopefully, yep, yeah, so I can see the chat um, on the side. So hopefully if you've got any questions or anything, I can see that. Um, I hope you haven't missed any that you, you guys have sent in, but yeah, I can see the messages coming through live. So hopefully if you, or answers, if you want to share answers as you have been, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, but hopefully that's nice and clear. So that's a nice little bit of consolidation there for the questions we've done. So I'm going to move this on now and look at exponential graph transforms. But as I said, it'd be great to hear from you still throughout in the chat because um, the answers and comments have been brilliant. So um, please do continue to do that. Now, the next one we're going to be looking at, not reciprocal square function, we've just done that. Apologies, we're going to be looking at exponential functions. Who has covered exponential functions before? Who recognises exponentials um, and the general setup of an exponential? Do we know how these look? Have we covered this in school? Um, I don't think it's something I ever covered at GCSE. I don't think I met this till I was in year 12. So it'd be really good to know if you know in general what an exponential function looks like. Um, it's a very good function for modeling different aspects of life. And it has been for the last couple of years. Um, so it, whether it's a financial system, a pandemic, a population growth, exponential functions are really important to understand and know how they sort of look and behave. So hopefully you've come across this, but if not, the general form of an exponential is like something to the power of X. So even, excellent, well done. So some of you will recognize things like E to the power of X as a really sort of perfect exponential model because um, it's got very important characteristics. So anything to the power of X, but A to the power of X is the general form of an exponential. Um, and you might even think about this as like the, the growth rate or multipliers of like compound interest, or if it was going the other way or transformed, it could represent depreciation. So it's a really important concept and it will be tested sort of quite thoroughly in the exams. Now there's an important point, which some of you might notice here. What do we know about this? What do we know about the y-intercept? So imagine if you were to do a table of values and plug in X as various points. If you plug in x as zero, what do you know will always happen with this? What coordinate will the y-intercept always be? So if we plug zero in and we do anything to the power of zero, what is it? Well, we'll what we'll find is that y-intercept will be zero, one. All of these graphs, whether they're stretched, whether they're different bases, they're kind of pinned in position by zero one, because anything to the power of zero is one, um, which is quite interesting. So if the base number is a bit smaller, it might be a little bit flatter and then, you know, but it will still be pinned in position there. And actually, so if we have like two or 1.5 or 1.7 or whatever, what happens though, if we have one to the power of X? This is an interesting one. Because one to the power of anything is what? One to the power of anything is actually just one. So one to the power of X is actually just a horizontal straight line. It's just a confusing way of saying Y equals one. So this is just worth noting that the numbers are generally bigger than one because otherwise we'd have this straight line scenario um, unless it's like the other way around. So y equals one to the power of x is just the line y equals one. So that would be, if I draw that in, that would be the line y equals one to the power of x, but three to the power of x, four to the power of x, anything to the power of x otherwise greater than one will have that exponential growth look to it. So, what we've got here is we have got an asymptote, that idea of an asymptote again, will be always above the x-axis. 
So let me know if you recognize this. And by the look of the chat, it sounds like some of you have seen this before or you're very familiar with it. That's great um, because sketching this is a really sort of key skill and it's going to be an idea and a type of function we need to know and understand um, really well. So that's great. And thank you again for the comments that come through on that. Now we're going to look at transforming this again. So this one here, can anyone suggest what this kind of graph transformation will do? So if I had, let's imagine this original shape that's drawn on both of here is y equals a to the power of x. This is the graph of y equals a to the power of x. And that's what I'm transforming in this following way. How would, what would happen or what would be produced if I did a to the power of x plus one, where x plus one is in the power, it's in the function. What kind of graph transformation am I dealing with here? And I do want to just say thank you again for all the comments and questions throughout. I know this might be a topic that actually you, you've done a lot of or you recognize a lot from GCSE anyway, but it is a really crucial skill because as your topics evolve, this skill is sort of underlying all the kind of graphs and function stuff. So when we start doing domain and range um, and all that sort of thing, you still need to understand how these graph transformations are having an effect. Um, and sort of fluency with this skill is really important. So a to the x plus one, what kind of graph transformation have we got here? Well, if we're comparing to the original thing as f of x, this would be f of x plus one. Can anyone tell me what that will do? So there's the original graph. If I do x plus one in the function, I think we've had similar earlier, and people have suggested what we do with this. So f of x plus one in the function, brilliant. It does, it moves it to the left by one, superb suggestion. Um, thanks very much for that. So take the points again, and remember like two boxes on here is one unit. So we're gonna move it all to the left by one. Okay, so the shape's not stretching, it's not moving up or down. Oh, it's not moving up or down at all, but it is moving to the left by one. And where people do go a bit wrong is they think there's an asymptote here, but there's not. There's only, it will still take off and go to infinity. There's only this horizontal asymptote, which is actually unaffected because it's not moved up or down. So it's just all the individual points have slid along that way by one. So thanks very much for that comment. And well done if you knew that as well, if you were happy with that, that's great. What about this one then? How is this different to this? So a to the x plus one. How is that? How is this one different? How would I sketch this in comparison to the original a to the x graph? What would we do here? So for this one here, what, what's going on? You've got your one to compare to that's already drawn out. Brilliant, excellent. Thank you for the suggestion there and absolutely spot on. Well done. So this one is going to move up by one. And hopefully everyone agrees with that. This is affecting it on the outside. So this is up by one. Superb suggestion. Thanks for that. Um, and lovely to hear from different people here today as well. Um, it's great that everyone's following this and kind of confident, even with the different types of graphs. So um, do and don't worry if at all you're wrong with any suggestions. Um, because actually relating this and being able to pick up on these skills, the reason we're doing this um, is because it's one of these common topics that people do get wrong in the exams, but also that they're designed to be quite tricky. Now, again, what we've got is this one will affect the asymptote in very much the exact same way it's affected the whole graph. So this time the asymptote will... Whoops, move up as well because it was a horizontal asymptote. So I'm going to just draw that in in, uh, in green here. So that asymptote will now be the line y equals one and the y intercept will now be through two. So that's good. Well done if you're happy with that. Um, do feel free. Let's have a look to ask any questions. If you've got any questions, you want to confirm anything, please let me know. What happened to 
what bit do we want to check there? So this asymptote that was, oh, brilliant question. So we, we mentioned this, that was a really important point. So the asymptote has moved up here. Nothing has actually affected the asymptote in the first graph. So that was a superb question. And I do want to just clarify that. Because we've just slid this along, an exponential graph only has an as a horizontal asymptote. There's no vertical asymptote. I know sometimes it's drawn and it sort of looks like there is, but for an exponential growth, there isn't. It just takes off really rapidly. So not, the actual asymptote in this first one is unaffected. You've just slid it along, so it's approaching it at different points, but it's still tending towards the x-axis because we've not moved it up or down. So unlike a reciprocal graph, which has horizontal and vertical asymptotes, an exponential only has an asymptote horizontally. So if you move it left or right, the asymptote will still stay where it is at the x-axis. But because in the second example, we've moved it up, up or down will affect the asymptote. So in the first one, the asymptote is, is remain, remains unaffected. Does that make sense? That was a brilliant question. Um, and I'm glad you've got me to confirm that because we sort of whizzed on from that earlier. Um, so I think I mentioned it, but it's, it is worth knowing an exponential doesn't have a vertical asymptote. So that's why that doesn't move left or right. Um, but moving it up or down will affect it. Does that make sense? Um, and thank you for that question. That was a really important point to stress. So we actually see the change with the asymptote in the second one because it is translated as well. Whereas in the first one, the translation does not affect it. Brilliant question, another excellent question there. So does the asymptote um, sort of get affected when you stretch or squash it? Um, so no, so in general for these kind of graphs, the individual points will sort of stretch further away or stretch closer, but because it's infinitely approaching an asymptote, then it won't, for this kind of graph, change from a stretch just from a vertical shift that's a really important point so if you just if you stretched it it's sort of taking longer or it's getting there at different points the individual points have moved up but because infinitely they're approaching it they're still approaching it infinitely just at a different point down the graph so really good question when it's like that kind of horizontal asymptote at the x-axis like an exponential and you stretch the points stretch them away or closer to zero, ultimately they're still tending towards the same thing. However, if you've shifted it for a, like a reciprocal graph left and right where there's vertical ones, um, there could be effects of the stretch that we need to be careful with. But for asymptotes, not so much. That's more things like quadratics and turning points and polynomial functions where individual points are changing. Um, but no, in answer to that question about the asymptote here, that won't affect it, the stretch and um, compressions and stretches, if that's all you're doing. Um, so it's really just the shift. So brilliant couple of questions there, guys. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to see, though, we're going to do a few more. Um, and actually, that's what I think that's going to be what we lead on to. Um, so you've kind of preempted where we're going with this. So this one here is exactly what we've said. This function here, a bit like one we did earlier, this is f of 2x, and this one here would be 2f of x, and hopefully we all agree with that. So this one will be a compression by a factor of a half, because inside the brackets you do the opposite to x. So let us look what happens to the x values. This one here will be at 1, 0. If you half it, it's still at 0. This point will be here. This point will be here and so on. So what we've got is it's sort of become more tightly packed. It has sort of squished it that way, but it hasn't affected the asymptotes because ultimately it's still going to end up tending towards them. So hopefully this is modeling exactly what you were asking about there. Um, and likewise for this one, this is stretching it in the y direction. So we might think, oh, so maybe that would affect the asymptote. But if you stretch zero, by two, it's still zero. So all these points just end up moving sort of doubly far out. That's all that's happening when you stretch it. So they sort of look like they're kind of coming away from the axis or the asymptote a bit at that individual point, but ultimately they're still going to tend to the same place. 
So the asymptote will still remain horizontally at the x-axis. So hopefully that's nice and clear, but that was a really, really good couple of questions there, guys. Thanks very much for that. We're gonna also now look at reflections and then we'll do a, a little checkpoint and some exam questions again. But if you can be confident in recognizing this and being sort of quite, being able to critique, okay, these things will change, these things won't, and you can sketch it, then this is a really key exam skill that we wanna have. So let's look at this one. Now, interestingly with this, this looks a little bit weird. I'm going to remind us here that this is the same as a to the minus x. So this is kind of recapping maybe what you've done with index laws or indices. Is everyone happy with that? And Because I don't think that's immediately obvious to spot that. But is everyone happy that 1 over a to the x is the same as a to the power of minus x? Because a minus power deals with a reciprocal. So what this effectively is, is this is like f of minus x. If we think of it like that. So what this is, this is actually a reflection in the x-axis. So it's sort of pinned in position there. And it's going to reflect in the following way. Try and do it as neatly as possible. Oh dear, that wasn't very good. Um, let me try and kind of as smooth as possible, reflect it around the y axis. OK, now this one, on the other hand, we can sort of observe as minus f of x. So this is a reflection in the x axis because it's on the outside. The y coordinate is going negative. So where it was positive, it would now be negative. So it's reflecting in the x axis, a bit like how x squared when it's negative reflects in the x axis. It's the same sort of process. So what this will do is this will reflect down here in the following way. And this will look like that. Okay. Oh, oops. Let's try that again. Hopefully, you get the idea. Getting a bit um. Yeah, we'll go with that. Okay. So let's have a little quick checkpoint, just a one, two or a three. Let me know how you're feeling with that sort of stuff. So exponential graphs in general, how they look, the fact that there's this horizontal asymptote and then otherwise it sort of takes off. Um, why is it going to... Oh, brilliant. Right, really good question. Um, and I'm going to backtrack to that now. So I've had a really good question come in. The first graph on here, why is this a reflection in the x-axis? Shouldn't it be in the y-axis? So... The reason for this is if the minus is in the function, which it is because if we've got an a to the minus x, the, the sorry, the exponential idea is the to the x bit, and that's the bit that's negative. So of course you could plot this, you could do a table of values and plot it and you'd see what happens. But if we can recognize it as f of minus x, when it's in the brackets, what you're doing is you're affecting the x value in the coordinate, aren't you? And if you turn the x value to the negative version of itself, when x, x is one, it's really gonna do what it would do at minus one. So x is so what you're doing is by changing the x to the negative, then you're actually reflecting it around the, the y axis because the x coordinate is going negative. Good question. So the other question is how is this f of minus x? And I actually think this is probably one of the hardest ones to spot on there. So I'm going to just clarify this. So all of these graphs we've dealt with are to do with a to the x, they're transformations of a to the x. And that's the one that we've got sketched there every time. So this graph here is a really good question. This graph here is a to the x. That's how it looks. So what we're doing is if we think of f of x as a to the x, and I want to sketch 1 over a to the x. 
What I want to check first of all, is everyone happy that that is a to the power of minus x? When it's one over a to the x, from index laws, which we've hopefully seen before, this is the same thing. Because we've got to try and make that comparison to a graph we do know. I don't think this is immediately obvious, but does everyone recognize that if you have a minus power, like if you have two to the power of minus five, it's one over two to the power of five. So if you have a to the power of minus x, it's one over a to the power of x. So we can, by taking it out of that fractional form and putting it in an index form, we can now make an easier comparison to the graph of a to the x because we can go, oh, it's like having the minus in the function. Does that make sense? Because that's a really valid point, a really important question. And I actually do think this is the hardest one to spot out of all the ones we've done today. So do let me know if you need me to consolidate that a little bit more, um, because I can see how this would be tricky. Brilliant. Thank you for confirming that, though, because I think once we can recognize it as this, which most people won't do easily, most people won't go, oh, yeah, it's just that. Once we've got it like that, though, it is possible to compare it to this graph because it's f of minus x. Now, can I just check um, from the previous messages that this is clear why this is a reflection in the y-axis? Yeah, so the function we're sketching is 1 over a to the x. That's what we've drawn here in red. Um, but it's easier to think of that as a to the minus x, as a reflection in the y-axis of a to the x. Yes, that's what we've sketched. Brilliant. So there were a couple of really, really good questions that came in there um, together, and it was a really important point. But I just want everyone to be happy that inside the function, if it's a minus, you're reflecting it around the y-axis, which is exactly what happened here. And I think that was probably one of the hardest ones we've done today. So very well done. Um, so little indication of that, um, if you haven't already, just a one, two or a three. Um, and then what we're going to do on here is we're going to look at final couple of exam questions just to wrap this up nicely. And um, we'll go from there. So very well done. And thank you for the questions and answers as we've gone. Let's do these exam questions now. So sketch the curve y equals six times five to the x. Now, okay, no worries. So if there's anything you want me to backtrack and re-explain, um, feel free to let me know. We'll get through these and I'm happy to reshare the screen and go over anything um, just so that everyone's nice and confident with this. So just very quickly, I'm gonna sketch the answers to each of these questions here. Now, at A level, as we mentioned, it is often just a sketch that we want. So you haven't got to be, um, it's not like GCSE where they say plot and you do a whole table of values and plot every point. We just want to know, do you know the shape and do you know, know where the asymptotes are? Do you know any intersections with the axes? So 5 to the x we know is an exponential. So it will have an asymptote at the x-axis and it will go through 0, 1 because that is the, the defining feature of that sort of graph. So it will look like five to the X would look like that. Now, six times five to the X, what is happening to the five to the X graph? It's like times in by six on the outside. So if that's F of X, six times it is a stretch in the Y direction. So what that will mean is the point that would ordinarily go through zero, one, is getting stretched vertically to zero six. But as someone asked earlier, it will still eventually go to the same asymptote there at zero. It's just sort of taken off and gone up through zero six because we've stretched it by a factor of six. Okay, so well done if you got that. Now this one here, sketch the graph of y equals for k to the x. Well, it's very much the same thing. k to the x will go through 0, 1, but I've stretched it by a factor of 4, so it will go through 0, 4. And that is all it will do. It won't move the asymptote up or down because we haven't added anything. It's not sort of translated. It has just stretched it. Why? Oh, good question. Why is an exponent negative after stretching? So, because what we've done 
is we've stretched it on the outside by a positive number and they've told us k is a positive constant there's no sort of negative um reflection or impact on this this is basically like on the outside we're affecting the y values by timesing so we're just scaling we're just stretching it vertically sort of away from the axis so yeah so well done if you picked up on those intersections of the axes that's absolutely right but the idea is we've got this very straightforward exponential shape that would normally go through zero one and have x axis as the asymptote and all we've done is we've stretched those points sort of six times further away or six times taller in y for this one and um four times taller in the other one. Oh, sorry yeah if k was negative um, so that was a really good point. They've said K is positive, though. K is greater than one. Um, we've got to be careful what bit is negative. So because K is actually the base, the thing we're doing to the power of X, it would matter if four, if it was minus four, that would reflect it in the in the X axis. Um, but they've told us it's all positive. So if we had like a negative scale factor, it would reflect it in the x axis, absolutely. Uh, but we haven't got that going on here. So hopefully that's nice and clear. Um, and I'm happy to backtrack. So if anyone would like me to go back over any previous questions, please do let me know. Um, there's no problem with like consolidating or asking me about bits we've already done. That's absolutely fine. Thank you for the questions and answers coming through today. Um, hopefully they've been able to sort of tease out the kind of key things. So what we've looked at is we've looked at the shape of reciprocal and exponential graphs. We've looked at transforming them and understand if and when the asymptotes are affected. Oops. So I'm happy to sort of backtrack over any of these if anyone wants to clarify any of them. Um, do feel free to ask. We looked at this one over x squared graph, which was really good as well. This was the reciprocal square function, which I personally think is unfamiliar to a lot of people when they start a level. So even if you're really happy with one over x and minus one over x, one over x squared is something we haven't often touched upon or seen before. So this is a really good one to kind of know and recognize as well and be able to still apply these graph transformations to it, which we did in the format of an exam style question. So hopefully that was useful. Um, but if you do want me to clarify or consolidate any of this, do let me know. Um, I think, as I've said already, this is a really important topic that will carry you through a lot of the pure content in year 12 and 13, if you can really nail this skill. Um, so do, as I said, feel free to ask any questions. Thank you for joining um, the YouTube session today. What I do just want to do now actually is I'm going to stop sharing that. But if you have any questions, I've still got the chat open. So feel free to ask about that. Um, if you haven't already checked out Snap Revise, uh, there's a lot on the site. So do head over to it. And what we've got is web classes happening all throughout the week. So there's four sessions per week, uh, year 12 web class, a year 13 web class and then drop-ins as well where you can send in any homework or any questions or, or kind of um, homework type questions if you've got an exam coming up topic lists types of questions textbook questions anything you want help with the drop-in is kind of an open session for going through and dealing with what you're working on at school but the web classes go through the whole content um, of year 12 and 13 pure mechanics and stats um, and they run quite regularly and also if you've got access to the platform you'll be able to watch previous sessions as well um, but there's loads on here there's kind of like diagnostic quizzes there's revision packs it's all laid out really nice and clearly so you can take the quizzes and it will pinpoint what bits of the course you need to work a bit more on and then kind of design the questions based on that so you can take the kind of quick little quiz multiple choice quizzes I'm just going to guess here try and get through it really quickly if you haven't seen this before I'm not very good at guessing am I um keep going with B uh, but obviously you, you take your time and work through this nice and carefully um what it will do is it will work out kind of the, the areas you need to work on and then produce a resource that helps us um go from there and tailors your revision towards it so what's really good is that this is the whole course bang up to date uh, broken down into kind of bite-sized chunks 
um, and then it kind of pinpoints exactly where you're at with the topic and you can then watch the videos and dive into the questions specifically at the points you need help um, as well as all the kind of exam packs um, of questions with the mark scheme all attached so it's brilliant for revision um, and just breaks down every aspect of the course really nicely um, which I think is really important because there's a lot of maths resources out there. There's no shortage of maths questions on the internet, but this is tailored really to all the A-levels that were reformed in 2017. So it's all kind of bang up to date, um, broken perfectly into mechanics, stats and pure, aligned with all the different boards and the different courses. So aside from the web classes and the drop-ins, which I think generally prove effectively, um, really effective with students, because um, they often run parallel to what you're doing in school. This uh, sort of stuff, the extra revision content we've got on the platform as well is superb. So um, if you do, if you are interested in joining that, feel free to check out Snap Revise on there. It was lovely that you guys joined and sent your questions in throughout today. Uh, oh, I've just seen the question about the trickiest topic in year 12. Um, personally, I think, no worries, well done. Thank you so much for the questions uh, and answers as we've gone through that. In answer to the question about what's kind of tricky about year 12, I just think generally, in my honest opinion, the standard really jumps from GCSE. There's a lot of recap at GCSE from lower down the school. Um, and the pure content really does increase in difficulty. For most people, there's a part of the applied that they struggle with. So some people have a bit of a knack for stats. They like statistics. Others maybe are more inclined to like the mechanics and the physics kind of side of it. Um, but I think really in, in general, there's a lot more breadth and also it just increases in difficulty a lot. So by year 13, the pure is quite involved. You're doing a lot of calculus and trigonometry. That takes up the bulk of the year 13 content. And I would say that is quite tricky because it's quite new. Um, but yeah, really well done. Uh, and as I said, in the drop-in sessions, uh, that we run through Snap Revise. Going through these topics very carefully, we can do, but always answering questions at the end as well. Uh, we like to do in the web classes. So um, do check that out if you're interested in that. But thanks very much, guys, for all your questions and answers today. Have a good rest of your weekend um, and hopefully see you at one of these sessions soon. That's great. Take care, guys. Well done. And um, thanks again. No worries. Thank you. Well done. Have a good weekend. Keep well and hopefully speak to you soon.